Ballet Board and a member of the Ambassador Committee. I'd like to welcome you tonight, this exciting night. This is the first time I've ever seen it full. <laughs> it's great. Um, we are going to have the uh, dance talk tonight wherein we will become more familiar with the creative nature and artistry behind the upcoming performance of Sylvia. Uh, these dance talks are a favorite of mine, and they've become very popular with, with a lot of you I see, that uh, it provides a much more personal approach to all the ballets in our repertoire. We're able to see firsthand, listen in on conversations with the dancers, designers, and the choreographers, where we get to understand their experiences and how creating the magic that we enjoy as an audience. The dance talks themselves, if you enjoy attending, we, uh, we would like to, sorry. <laughs> the, dance, the, the dance talks themselves, that uh, if you enjoy attending and would like to hear how to attend more behind the scenes events and to meet the artists, after the discussion, we will meet in the lobby where you can learn how to become more involved. We will have information about the uh, other programs. We'll have information about upcoming events and, and performances, the dates, as well as membership. I will also be happy to discuss my own personal involvement with the company and introduce you to members of the staff who are here to answer any questions you might have. We have a great season in store, and your personal involvement will only enhance that experience for you during this upcoming season. I want to thank you for joining us this evening, and now we'll turn it over to our Director of Education and Community, community Engagement, Jennifer Summers. Thank you, Mark. All right, I'm going to invite our illustrious panelists to the stage, and then we will get started with um, a commercial that I'm going to use to frame our discussion tonight, so make sure you're paying attention. Houston Ballet is pleased to present the world premiere of Stanton Welch's Sylvia. Three separate but intertwined love stories featuring a constellation of mythological characters. For tickets, visit HoustonBallet.org or call 713-227-ARTS. Sylvia, a love story fit for the gods. Please, please give that a round of applause. Likely I don't need to make these introductions, but I'm going to just in case anybody needs uh, to have some context. I'm Jen Summers, the Director of Education and Community Engagement. If you wouldn't mind turning off uh, uh, noise-making devices, that would be appreciated. If you need to leave at any time throughout the talk tonight, we, that is absolutely fine. We just ask that you use the exit doors uh, behind the seating. Um, and then I'm just gonna jump right in. To my left, of course, you know this is our artistic director and the choreographer and creative mind behind Sylvia Stanton Welch. And to his left is Wendell Harrington, who will be doing the projection design for this performance. Don't clap yet, because I'm gonna tell you, she's the one who made the Nutcracker tree grow look like it's going through the roof of the Wortham. And to her left is J Jerome Kaplan, who is the costume and set designer and the mind behind all this incredible creation you hear, see on the stage tonight. And don't worry, I will leave time for your questions as well. I'm gonna jump right into the three women aspect. Um, this is an interesting ballet for many reasons, even though it's one of the oldest scores. Um, but one of, the, one of the many reasons I find it interesting is we're used to having a lead, a female lead. And Stanton's taken, us, uh, taken this tale and turned it into a story for three ladies. And I wondered if you could start by giving us just a little snippet, not necessarily about the story, but the characters themselves. Who are Sylvia, Artemis, and Psyche? 
what kind of people are they? Are they gods? That, that kind of thing, who their general, uh, where, where generally they live in this world. Am I on? Yes, okay. Um, well, it, it, it's a big question. Yeah. So Artemis is a, is a god. She is the daughter of Zeus and the, bro the sister of Apollo. So if you just want to imagine that this is a kingdom and there's a king and queen and that's Zeus and Leto, then they are the next in line princess and prince. Um, and she is a character that is interesting. In the original ballet, she was Diana, which is the Roman version. This is the Greek version, Artemis. Um, and the idea of her is that she comes across as cold, that she's fascinated by work, fascinated by what she does, but she doesn't have time for emotional stuff. And uh, so that's her character, and understanding why did she become like that, and how does she move forward from that. Um, Psyche is a character that is uh, connected to Eros. Eros in the original in the Roman is uh, Cupid and in the Greek is Eros, so it's the same character. And he's full of mischief and trouble and, and loves to create drama. Um, and his love interest and he are kind of similar. They make mistakes. They have a relationship, they promise each other something and it doesn't work out. And then they promise each other something and it doesn't work out. But that still is a good relationship because they keep apologizing for it and understanding it and moving forward. So that's her love interest. It, it's, it's, she's an interesting character because she's foiled right from the beginning. And then Sylvia is the balletic character. She doesn't really exist in mythology. Um, and she was what Delibes had written into the story. And her story, I think, is really about the decision between uh, romance or, or life and work and ambition. And that she has to choose between those two things because it's hard to balance them. And she is initially all about her work and her job. And then she has a choice to be something else. And she has to debate that choice. It's ballet, so she gets to live both worlds. She doesn't really have to make the choice. But we do put the choice in front of her and, and, and watch her agony as she decides that. And each of these women has a love interest or at least a friend interest. Can you introduce us to their yes. couple? Yes. Uh, the interesting thing with Artemis was she was celibate. She is a huntress. She believes uh, in, in her work above all else. She wasn't reported to have any lovers. But there were a few people that she had very strong connections to, and Orion is one of them. And he was a fellow hunter, and they loved to do the same things, and they respected each other. And in the ballet, there is a chemistry between them, but it doesn't consummate itself into relationships. So it's about how you can love someone, and there isn't a sexuality to it. It's, it's just deep friendship love, and how that can be enough. You know, it doesn't always have to be other loves. Um, now I forgot what... Okay, so then Eros is the second question. Psyche. Uh, Eros and Psyche. Eros is passionate, beautiful, uh, full he's of... He's a god. He's a god, and he's full of trouble and mischief. And so then he ends up with... His love interest is the same type of way. Um, and their story is about that, is about how everyone has mistakes and fumbles and you have to pick yourself up and, and keep going. And that's really a great relationship. And here. then he's responsible for Sylvia's love interest also, right? Yeah, he's caused a, a lot of drama throughout the story. Um, the reason he, Sylvia falls in love with the shepherd is from Eros. He shoots her with an arrow. She falls in love with the first person she meets. And it's the shepherd. And the shepherd doesn't know that she's been magically tricked. So he falls invested in her. And when Eros removes the arrow from Sylvia, she has to rediscover, is she in love with this man? Um, and that's their story. So she's gone through the whole first two acts in a spell, in love with someone. And at the end of act two, she discovers it was a spell and has to re-examine, is she really in love with this person and willing to leave everything, all her ambition behind and support him. Um, yeah. So those, I mean, there are three distinct characters and really three, 
different kinds of love. How do you manifest that and what are things we can look for choreographically, particularly in the partnering, to show the different kinds of relationships? So it was interesting. Of course, in Sylvia and the Shepherd, you have a more traditional love. Uh, you have the fact that she's completely in love with him instantly and he learns to love her. But the puzzle choreographically was that she's the instigator. So if I offer my hand, you will take my hand. That's the normal masculine feminine way. If you offer your hand, normally a woman would do that and I'd come in still under and repeat the same gesture. So we're trying to reverse all those those ideas. And so that happens all the way through the part de deux. And that was a puzzle because it was amazing how instinctively we're trained as dancers to react masculine and feminine. And then you go, okay, so if you're the choice maker and the dominant and I'm the opposite, how do you, how do you get kissed by, uh, how do you lift someone's chin? How does a lady lift a chin and bring the man in to kiss? Uh, there were interesting puzzles. So that was the choreographic puzzle of that. Artemis and Orion never kiss and never make love. They, they are friends. And that was tricky, that's tricky. And so there was all this symbolism about being close to someone that you love and you feel that energy, but you don't move next on it. So that was all their part of those. Psyche and Eros are a little bit more passionate and, and normal to choreograph, except for she is trouble and she keeps getting into trouble and, and finding a way to, to mess stuff up. Um, and that, that's what's fun about her. So the, they each have um, a, a, a love interest, even if Orion's not exactly that kind of love, and they also each have... It is a love. Yes, oh, and well, And that's the interesting right, thing, romantic. is that you can have a love that is as equally important that has no sexual, yes. you know, so... And then they each have... Um, there's lots of things that happen to them in their journeys, but they each have a, a, a villain, and I, in a way... I, I keep the more I learn about Sylvia the, or the ballet, I more I think that Psyche might, in some ways, be her own villain. Sure, I think you could say that about each of them. They each make a mistake. I think the interesting thing about storytelling um, is that you want to find the mistake. If someone is just good or bad, it, it's hard to understand. But if if they're they're navigating and sometimes navigating the wrong way, that immediately connects you to them. So I, I think that Psyche, yes, of course, but Sylvia makes wrong choices too, and Artemis definitely makes wrong choices. So they're all, they're all good and bad. And what about the other, the villains? The villains yeah. So the villains for Artemis and uh, Orion is Apollo. Apollo is her twin brother. In some of the mythology, it implies that Orion and Apollo were actually lovers, and Apollo grew jealous of the fact that he was only a sexual interest to Orion and not Orion's mental interest, which was his sister, which is extremely complex and advanced for where we are, you know. Um, and I loved that. I thought that was such an amazingly difficult story to tell. And uh, the, the jealousy between these two and, and where that leads. So that was very interesting. Elpheus with Sylvia and the Shepherd is from the ballet story. And he's a little bit more normal. He's just bad. And he wants to capture a nymph and he's determined to do it. And he waits for that vulnerable moment when she re removes her armour and he takes her. And that's from the ballet. The name Elpheus is actually from real mythology. And he did capture one of Artemis's nymphs and keep her prisoner for many years. So I tried to, to use that as the connection as to why his character is Alpheus. Um, and then the final one, the villain, is Aphrodite. So Eros is very connected to his mother. Aphrodite is the most beautiful woman in the world, very much like all the Grimm's folk stories that we know, Cinderella's mother or Snow White's mother. Um, and she's obsessed with her own beauty. And this young girl comes along who is more beautiful, so she sends her son to kill her. And in doing that, of course, her son falls for psyche so she is a villain in the true walt disney version of the evil <laughs> queens and laughing and looking in a mirror all the time and, and so yeah they're, they're interesting characters 
So I'm going to switch to you, Jerome, because we, one of the things that we've got these three different leads, they're each a different kind of being. So Psyche is a mortal, a human. Uh, Sylvia is a demigod, and Artemis is an Olympian. Also, they are, their stories are sometimes going on from one scene into the next. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how you created a visual uh, identification between those three types of beings and also between the three women. Um, and if you want to take your mic and jump up and move around, you are more than welcome to. So, um, it's, it's very simple. I just choose different colors and different um, uh, metallic. Uh, we, we have uh, for God, we have gold. For demigod, we have silver. And we have colors for the mortal. So in a way, it's really simple. So the gold for the Olympians, the silver for the demigods, mm -hmm. so that when we, when, we, when we talk demigods, one of the primary demigods we're going to be seeing is Sylvia and the other nymph, nymphs in Artemis's army, right? And then what did you say for the human beings? Um, it's more colorful in a way, and it's more textural. There is some pleats and some rough silk, a little bit, yes, to be different, less, um, it's more heavy in a way, more concrete. Mortals are more like uh, wools and cotton, mm -hmm. where the gods are in fabrics that are more of modern, Chif yes, modern or day. Based, yeah. light, sh chiffon, silk chiffon. Mm. So to my right is, a, is an Olympian. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is a... Zeus. Zeus, yes. Ah, that's Zeus. I think so. <laughs> the king. Zeus. Yes. Zeus. Yes. 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 Zeus. And then to, uh, to his, Zeus uh, is right, that's Artemis. 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 And so yes. she's got that... Uh, metallic underneath to represent her, uh, uh, her uh, yes, her world. Yes, and Elf, then Elpheus yeah, and Sylvia. And Sylvia would be the demigod, and that's what Sylvia and the army of nymphs all wear. That absolutely great, mm -mm. good. And what about? Can you talk a little bit about the armor too? Because I know that that's been fascinating to me as I've dropped it down into the wardrobe department periodically seeing how the concept of the armor has evolved over time? Uh, I think, uh, I don't remember really, I think it's come from Greek, Greek style, Greek statues first, and we were thinking about that idea to give the, the, the idea of a perfect body, you know, you are a god, so you are perfect uh, everywhere, <laughs> so that's why we did that, you know. <laughs> So actually, Karina Gonzalez, who's playing Sylvia, told me the story of first meeting you, and she f she feels, uh, or she can she thinks that you in her Sylvia costume gave her a little more curve than she maybe <laughs> had always. naturally. Yeah. It's always the, yes, the idea to yes to try to to make them the most sexy as possible. So always, always, that's always the same idea, you know. Even you doing Giselle or. So um, what about the, um, the dancers? I mean, the, maybe some of the folks don't have to move as much in the armor, but tell us about the, the, the nymphs. I've seen the dancing without armor, and there's a lot of it. How did you, uh, what, how did but that? Mean, about the technique, you mean? Yes. It's a different technique. It's a neoprene. Neoprene. It's a neop neoprene fa Which is fabric. Which wetsuit fabric, wetsuit yes. material. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's really... Um, Soft and stretch and easy to sew and uh, easy, not so easy, <laughs> but uh, possible to sew and to. <laughs> yes. And after it's covered by a fabric, a silver fabric, and it's glued to it, so it's a bit, uh, a bit tricky. Mm -hmm. Interesting for the workshop to do. And it maintains its shape then, like a wetsuit mm. does. So you can make the armor; it's completely bendable and flexible and washable. But if you stand it by itself, it, it will maintain its structure. And that's an important point in the story, yes? Sort of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I've kind of recently removed that moment, but um, <laughs> it, it was, it was in, the, in the concept. That, it, yeah, it needs to look, if you move inside it, that it stays solid. Right. You don't want it to move and bend with you. Otherwise, it looks like a leotard. Yeah. Right. Um, I guess, can I get you to talk a little bit? Uh, well, you know what, I'm going to pause on that. I do want to talk before we, we, we go too far about the River Gang, but I guess um, I'd like to shift to, because those are cool, um, <laughs> but I'd like to shift to um, the, the two worlds. So we've talked a little bit about the three women, their loves, 
their nemesis, their, the, their, their villains, um, and how you're supporting that visually costume-wise. But then let's move into the two worlds and how we've got to be on, in the human world and in the God world at the same time. How, what was the conversation around that between all of you? <laughs> uh. Uh, so the discussion was how do we... Because in the ballet, we need to jump from scene to scene and place to place pretty quickly. So the set and the scenery is uh, a space that can be moved and used in many, many ways. So really, Wendell will take us <laughs> from, from <laughs> one world to another. Because, for example, when Psyche arrives, that flowers and, and organic things can be around her. Uh, that's something that can come through projection that we don't need to do. Uh, and that will diversify. Of course, lighting does that too. But uh, I think that a large part of that, the set change will be in how we light and project on it. Okay. Can you talk about your work together? Um, yes. Jerome and I, this is our third, fourth ballet? Third. Third, third ballet we've done together. Um, so when we started to work on this, and um, I, it was to me very important that we have, the, I mean, the scenery, the, the physical plastic scenery, the doesn't change. It moves, but it doesn't change. So the thing that you're looking at is always the thing that you're looking at, but it did, was important that we make clear separation between the God's world and the human world, though sometimes they do get c combined in a way. Um, so how, how do you do that? And, it, and, and so it occurred to me, and we, we came here some time ago, and we built a model, and we put some things on it, and I brought a lot of research, and everybody, you know, we have these sessions where we do a lot of show and tell. How do you like this? How do you like that? What do you think about it? Um, and, and I was thinking a lot about what texturally it might look like. And when you think about what the God's world is and the Greek world itself, what we have of it is quite flat. It's, you know, when you look at the vases and you look, you know, it just what's remained for us. Um, the, the drawing is very flat. It's all lined with color put in. And um, so, it, so I started to think about that, and then I thought about what's the, what's the difference between line, and it's something that's more fleshy, more thick. So we started to look at, I mean, I looked at these different artists to just discuss, and I looked at this artist that I thought would be kind of good for the God's world, and it's Rockwell Kent, and he's, it's all made out of lines. And, and the set is also has, a, a marble quality to, to it is uh, painted in it. So, so far, you know, until next week when it's all completely different, because this is the thing about projection, it's always different. You have a completely solid idea, you've worked out everything, you know exactly what it's going to look like until you see it and you change everything. <laughs> but, right, <laughs> because unfortunately you can. Uh, I can do that with so, Christine. So at the moment, uh, I think the God's world is very, um, the, it, it's, it's made with lines, it's quite stark, it's quite graphic in a sense. Um, maybe it ends up having no projection at all. Uh, but the human world is very thick. And by thick, I mean the, the artists that I looked at are Bruegel and Roysdale. And I went for what I... Because there's no place for photography or anything that feels photographic or modern to me in this. So even if my sources might have been photographic because we're doing some tricks where we're doing things with dancer bodies as a basic thing, ultimately I make them hopefully look not photographic but painted. Because we're, we're I feel like I would betray the world that we want to be in if I made it feel modern. I mean, it's sophisticated, but not modern. So that's why I went to look at Bruegel, who was, to, for, if it's for me, he's a photographer in 1550. I mean, if you look at the work and you say, he's got every leaf of that damn tree on there. And you just, oh, okay, great. You know, and if you stood there and you, you put a camera down on the, you know, on the people doing the haymaking, 
Oh yeah, that's a photograph, but how did he do that? So that, that's, that's, those are the kind of elements that I'm trying to project onto the stage to give it the, the kind of thickness of life. Can I ask a question about the, so I've seen a, a drawing or a, a p photos of the model, and in a way, we're used to in a ballet, you go away at intermission and you come back and the stage looks completely different because you've put a new backdrop down and some new set pieces and some legs that look different. So you really have, uh, but what, what sounds to me, and I, just, and I want to repeat back what I think I'm hearing, is that we're going to see Jerome's essential set pieces maybe moved around a little, but they're going to look the same and you're changing location using entirely projection. Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, Jerome set has so many options that we don't come back to repeating any of them. So therefore you are seeing a completely different aesthetic every time. So I do think you still get that feeling as the curtain goes up before projection that it looks completely different all three times. Um, it's just uh, flexible. Um, but it's certainly the fact that in the beginning when you open, it's a Colosseum kind of idea with stairs coming in. And the next time it's the back of them and it's walls and big solid. They're, they're different. And then the final act is a surprise, but it is also different. So I, I don't think that it's, it's the same aesthetic that we change. It's completely different that okay. then we change. Okay, okay. So, and I've, I've seen up on the fifth floor uh, p pieces on wheels. So I'm assuming the dancers are doing some moving of set pieces as we yes, go through. Yes, everything is on wheels. So it's four sets of stairs that can make a thousand, well, more than a thousand, I'm sure, shapes. Um, so everything is trans, uh, transitions in and out of the, the space and can also have a complete 360 in how we operate it to the audience. So that is more, less limiting than when you do something like Romeo or Nutcracker where you go into the bedroom and you have her light and her bed and her walls. This is constantly, completely open to whatever we choose to do, which is, is ironically more challenging. Many Too many options, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm curious about how that works. So, uh, you know, if, if, scene by scene, it's, I mean, definitely the projection has to come into that, but Jerome had to build the set he with an idea. The puzzle. The puzzle. He okay. built a puzzle that we couldn't solve. <laughs> so then he left us with these pieces, and literally for months, I just moved those pieces around every day into different shapes. And then finally, at the 11th hour of the deadline that Wendell needed, I said, okay, I think this is what it is. And then we start. And then I'm sure on are tomorrow, you, we'll be completely be different. different. We get on the stage for the first time. So, I mean, we're talking about in a, in a normal set, you don't even have the, the ability to move something a foot. Yeah. Yeah. And in this, we could move it an inch or anything. Any single piece of it right. can rotate in any direction. So that... That's the puzzle. Okay, and that was you. You made it. You made puzzle pieces so that Stanton could create what he wanted. <laughs> Got it. The idea, yeah. And to yeah. drive me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> there is so many places to do for Sylvia. This was the idea. So there are so many scenes. You know, you're jumping. Yeah. That uh, you don't. You don't really want to do that. Madame Butterfly is one scene for Act One and one yeah. scene for Act Two. That's perfect. Yeah. Romeo and Juliet has five or six scenes in Act One. That's hard. It, it, yeah. You're jumping from space to space. What do you do with the audience's attention while you're jumping yeah. from space to space? All those things need to be resolved. In this, we have too much story and too little music. We had to move. We couldn't wait for things to and catch up. To, yeah. Tell the audience where we are okay. because we're here on, in the natural world, then we're back in the God's world. Oh, little stop in the underworld. <laughs> yeah, oh, right. maybe we should go to Alpheus Dungeon. You know, so, but, we, but you have to keep telling the audience where they are and move the pieces, and it's musical. It has to all be musical, yeah. so it's not like, eh, bring that thing in, or you know, move that thing over. No, 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 it's just, it just go, it flows from one beautiful thing. I mean, it has to be also a scenic ballet. Yeah. Yes, I was just going to say that. You choreographed the scenery. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. To music. Yeah. 
Um, and I think in plays and musical theatre even, this concept has been around and used much more often. Um, I've seen many plays uh, where you'll jump from the country in the scene just through lighting effects. Um, but or they're speaking. To a spot in the stage. Yeah, so you understand where we had to do that with visualization. And it's just that we, what the difference for you is you have the, the, the you need to eat up the, your dancers want to eat up the space with their bodies. So yeah. that's the extra challenge. Um, all right, let's move to props, and I want to talk a little bit about the another twist that this uh, ballet has, which is that. Um, you've, I've heard you talk a lot about that the, the women are in charge of their relationships, but they're also, they are warriors. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what we had to do differently with props and sets or how you designed um, props specifically for the, with the women in mind. But when I design the costume, I always design the props. Could you hold it closer? Oh, sorry. Yes, I, I always uh, design uh, the props uh, like weapons or sticks or close to the costume. So it's, yes, it was already designed with the costume. So we just follow that then. And we didn't add, so we had some magic box and few things, but, and after we discuss uh, what he, which, the size, uh, do you want to Props. speak to the, the evolution of the weapons? <laughs> sure. So, um, yeah, the ladies are weaponized, and the army, <laughs> the army arrives, and what they're there to do, and this is you know, written into the story, is to challenge each other and to fight, and their archers and their swordsmen and their shields. So, you know, bows and arrows are a little tricky. Uh, we went into swords and shields as well as bows and arrows, so you show the full gauntlet of activity. Every year we always have sword classes. It is actually a part of ballet, um, fencing, and uh, from Romeo and Juliet, even Nutcracker has sword fighting in it. It hasn't been long that we've had the ladies in the sword fighting. They started with Nutcracker, our version of Nutcracker. The soldiers hold wooden sticks at one point and they do a couple of hits. So that needed them to go into the class. Uh, so they've been in class. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting that I would not have thought about until this experience was the handle of the sword had to be smaller. So when I gave the man's swords to the ladies and their hands couldn't close around it, they were less capable of being uh, ferocious, yeah. Um, so that was something that was odd. The weight of them was the same because they're all sort of as, as light as we can make them. They're not sharp-edged. But uh, we did the normal process that we did with Romeo or any of those ballets. We have the class and then we choreograph it and then we bring in the sh sword instructor to help coach them on it. Um, but they've all been very ambitious and we have really good sword fights here. Uh, Romeo and Juliet certainly pushed that envelope up to re looking like a real film fight and uh, the ladies were right behind that in the charge. So. Uh, it hasn't been problematic. It was just interesting discovering, I think for them too, that you know, half an hour of holding a sword in one arm, your arm, you cannot hold your arm. Um, and that it's not the fight that's dangerous. The bit that's dangerous is when you're not fighting and you, you go like that and you hit someone behind you. So it, it's, it's, it's a much more like choreography and dancing than people expect fencing to be because it is so cut and there are positions, five positions, just like ballet. So, yeah. What about the incorporation of projection into any of the fighting, or any of the the, the action, or? Stay tuned. Oh. <laughs> There's. Well, uh, we have we have an idea for what that will be, but um, I don't want to give it away because okay. I'm not sure it's going to work. You know. <laughs> I'd like the nervous Nelly of the, you know, it's a, it's, it's a big idea and it's a complicated idea and a, so uh, stay tuned and uh, wish me well. <laughs> uh, but something will happen. Because swords are one thing but bows and arrows are, are Bows and arrows really are different hard. and they're also gods that are fighting so there are moments where uh, when Artemis and Apollo sword fight, the whole world fractures, the whole the universe shakes and trembles and ripples. So it's not even just 
you know, Wendell adding sparks, it's make the whole world fall apart because Artemis and Apollo are going to kill each other. It's not a mortal fight. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's go to the one epic tale part of our advertisement. And I, I, we've been talking a lot about the Greek inspiration, um, transferring this original Sylvia Ballet story from Roman to Greek. And I, I wondered if you could each talk a little bit about how that has contributed to your choreography and design. And I'm thinking... Stanton, since I had the privilege of seeing Act Three, in addition, uh, just what what sort of Greek imagery do you feel like you're fusing into the choreography? Uh, yeah, it's challenging. So I I researched folk, Greek folk dance, and then I started giving the dancers access to Greek folk dances that I could find that had certain shapes and rhythms, and there was a way that the Zorba the Greek I think is the most referable thing. There are definitely shapes, and in most ballets. Uh, in most countries, ballet has a version of what your shape should be. So ballet had a version of what Greek should be, and then we had the real Greek folk. Um, and then I gave them access to that, and I have access to it, and hopefully it washes out in you a little bit. But definitely the stepping through the heel of the foot first and, and the sense of the, the community of dancing together and the clicking that has a strange inward accent rather than what we're used to doing, which is flaring out and... Little things like that. So that's all flavoured through. And there are many shapes that are from statues and vases, like Wendell was saying, from the MFA or from Greek mythology, uh, of diagrams and shapes that I tried to replicate. Do you feel like they're in the, the mortals, the, the, the humans? It's a little bit in everything, because Sylvia chooses to be a mortal, so she brings that into them. and then. So I, I think... Yes, in Act 1, it's all very defined into groups. By Act 3, it's all a big milkshake of, of stuff. And what about for you, Jerome, in the uh, costumes specifically? The, the Greek influence. The, the Greek inspiration. Oh, but yes, for all the, the Olympians, because they, are, uh, uh, they must be all different and must be um, close to what, what it was, really. So I just... Uh, uh, try to find the most uh, precise document, like sculpture, uh, to to see what is the best look for Neptune or for every god. You know, so I was yes, it was a bit uh, uh, a serious uh, work, you know, to do, but interesting, interesting. It's not often that you have costumes that are statues, <laughs> so you can walk into the MFA and see their Artemis standing there in her dress <laughs> with her, you know, everything. So, I mean, you have a lot of points of reference from actual ancient art. Did that infuse any of the other costumes other than the Olympians for you? I'm not sure I understand. The Consider Greek, um, in the sort of the statues, the Greek statues, mm. did it, did it in inspire other costumes or just the Olympians? No, I think the others also, yes, probably. But also, you know, th there is different layers of Greek inspiration because it could be also uh, in Madeleine Vionnet, uh, uh, the famous uh, designer, uh, the French designer from the 20s, who work a lot with drape and uh, uh, really, uh, really Greek inspiration uh, fashion. Also, Fortuny was a, a kind of inspiration for the mortal, and also, yes, Fortuny in was really inspired by uh, Greek uh, statues. So uh, there is also different period in Greek uh, culture, um, and so we have these different layers uh, in my work, sure. Mm. Anything for you, Wendell? I totally looked at uh, a lot of Greek landscape just to sort of feel what the world was. And then I, I have to say, I backed up because it didn't feel right. It felt in some ways um, too specific that I didn't think that it was going to help the storytelling. So I just sort of stuck with uh, the, the, the paintings and, and, the, and the vases. Again, the, just that the sense of line that the Greeks have felt more representative because what what you can see of Greek landscape it just doesn't it didn't have the right feel it just felt sandy if that <laughs> right yeah <laughs> and it wasn't it wasn't gorgeous and I felt like the contrast between the gods and the earth the earth world has to be beautiful mm -hmm. it has to be in a way more beautiful 
than the God's world, otherwise it's an unfair advantage, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just visually, mm -hmm. that you just feel like, oh, I just want to be there. Yeah. And, the, and the, 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 I mean, what Stanton has done with the storytelling is there is this, this kind of push me, pull me, where it, it feels like, yeah, everything's got something good going for it, you know, so it needs that lushness. Uh -huh. so that you didn't find. That, well, I, I'm, yeah. I don't Not offend yet. Greece, but. So back to you with Greece. I think the some a fascinating part for me in the storytelling is the use of the fawns, which are definitely a Greek inspiration. But they are always with the human being, Psyche. Oh, no, they're with everyone. They're with everyone. They're okay. like a Greek chorus. I just might not have done enough choreography by the time you saw it. So the idea is they're the main thread. Ah. So they should, like, they link everything from one story to another. So the idea of them is to set up from one scene to another, to lead you from one change to another. So they are characters in each story and more predominantly in Eros and Psyche in her family story, but they are the, like a Greek chorus, the, the interaction or the thread from all the stories from beginning to end. And I mean, they, it seems to me like they push her along a bit. Everyone, they should, they push everyone. They should provoke everyone and also help explain to the audience everything. Like a Greek chorus? So, yeah, okay. so the idea is they're like a mirror or a reflector, that saying of all acting is reacting. Mm -hmm. So this is that, they are the reaction for all these stories. So hopefully they can pull your focus in and show you where to be and, and take you from one scene to another scene. So it's, it's just the final stage of choreography because everything had to be finished yeah. before I did that yep. scene. So then, like the the seamless set changes, the fawns will be a thread. That yes, through, weaves through it everything. All together. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, one last question on the um, one epic tale, and that is how how do these stories get woven together? They are three ladies, three different loves, three different villains. How do they get woven together? The story is all woven through Sylvia, through the Delib story. So, in the original Delib story. All the same thing happens to Sylvia. She has Diana is her boss, and at the end of the ballet, she says to Diana, can I go with my boyfriend? And Diana says, no. And then Eros says to her, but you had a boyfriend. And then she goes, okay. And that's the end. <laughs> so that little sentence was what I turned the whole right. ballet into. So how do you explain why is Artemis, Diana, cold? Why does she not want her women to love? Because she had her heart broken by her brother and her father. And that destroyed her love of men and she had anger about that. And I wanted to explain that. So when that moment happened and Sylvia asked her and she says no, we as an audience understand and feel for both of them. That's more emotional. And then when Artemis says, it's okay, go. What a huge revelation that is. And the same thing for Eros. Eros is, a, is nasty and spiteful and troublemaking. He has to learn a lesson. You don't want to watch him get through the end of the ballet and not go, how did you grow? So Psyche gives Eros that growth. He has someone he loves and he tricks and then she tricks and loves him and they mess up and then they get back together. And that, they have to apologize to each other and that is their story. So Eros, who is Cupid and Diana and Artemis, it's the same story as the Delibes. It's just taking that sentence of that one bit of storytelling and stretching it out into three acts. I feel like other conversations we've had, you've emphasized that a lot, in several moments in the, in the ballet, these characters are making moral decisions. Yes, yeah. many times. I think in all good storytelling, that's the case. So you have to have a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, to like a, an essay. Um, and if you haven't learned something, even if what you've learned is you learnt nothing, but you still have to learn something in the course of the story. So Psyche and Artemis and Sylvia have huge arcs and they all come to a conclusion and I, I think that's fun, that's nice. And they do get intersected through... They're uh, intersected in Act 2. Yeah, quite a bit. So, I mean, only Act 1 is them all separate yep. and then Act 2 they come together and Act 3 they're already mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just the beginning that it's three separate love stories. Yep. They collide in Act Two. Mm -hmm. So before I turn it over to the audience, would um, can we take a little tour of what we have on the prop table and some of the other costumes um, that we might want to 
that are non-human and Jerome? Just to say something? Yeah, just walk us.